Cool. Okay. Um, let me go full screen. <laughs> Can you guys all see my screen? Um, assuming that's going to be a yes, and just yes, we're good. My... Okay, cool. I'm going to go. Um, cool. Again, yeah. Welcome to the first Molecule Community Call. Um, so this is kind of like a brief summary of, again of like what we're doing, and it's been really interesting throughout this project of like focusing on like finding our main points of focus because um, the area of drug development is extremely wide. So essentially, Molecule is a protocol that enables the distributed R and D and funding of chemical intellectual property. Um, that was actually a really interesting design choice along the way to broaden the space out into chemical intellectual property in general. Um, because a lot of new therapeutics uh, might not be seen as, as drugs themselves, but um, there's a lot happening in that design space. Um, so Molecule itself is a distributed Web3 marketplace for price discovery, funding, and curation of drugs and therapeutics in various stages of development. Um, and our fundamental risk, what we're trying to do is uh, bring down the high cost and risk of drug development via distributed ownership and through that unlock new open source innovation mechanisms. Um, whoop, sorry, just jumped a slide. Yeah, so we all kind of, we've seen these numbers before and I'm going to run through them very quickly, but the big problem with drug development today that it's very expensive, it's very slow, uh, and it's very risky. Um, and on top of that, the industry is kind of hitting this, this big um, decline in innovation where it's expected that the internal rate of return within pharma companies across the industry is, a, is, is going to hit 0% in 2020, uh, which means that from an economic perspective, innovation in drug development is in the big, in big corporates is so low that um, it would be better economically to just cut R&D altogether. Um, so, but now if you think about how the pharmaceutical industry has driven innovation over the past 60 years to kind of alleviate some of the biggest um, medical challenges in the world, um, that's a really, really concerning trend. Uh, and on top of that, we're seeing, because of these numbers, because drug development is getting longer and more and more expensive, we're also seeing a large trend towards revenue-driven innovation. So more and more products are being pushed on the market that are not innovative, but rather just kind of um, slowly innovating along. We've seen this a lot in the, um, in the, in the pain medication market, um, where essentially more and more drugs are being pushed onto the market that create consumers uh, and not necessarily treat patients. Um, so there's a famous article from, from Goldman Sachs from 2016 that is titled, Is Curing Patients a Sustainable Business Model? Um, the way that the current industry works, it's not. And so what we're really trying to do with Molecule is look at the incentives that the industry has in creating innovation today and what the fundamental value drivers are for that innovation. Um, and one really interesting thing to ask is, does the, whole, does the industry have to work in this way? Uh, and we think it doesn't have to and that its current innovation model is broken. And how can we fix it? Um, whoop. Cool. So our kind of thesis is that drug development is where software development was about 30 years ago. Um, so big pharma companies today operate in a very similar way as IBM or Microsoft were developing software in the late 80s and early 90s. So extremely closed source. Everything is proprietary. There's very little collaboration between, between different players. Um, industry is very secretive. Negative data isn't published. Um, and what happened in the late 90s then, as a response to Microsoft bringing more and more proprietary software onto the market, uh, we saw the launch of the Linux Foundation, um, which really started promoting open source, open source software development. And if you think about how pharma development works today, it's extremely capital intensive um, and very slow and proprietary. Uh, and that obviously makes it very expensive um, because if you think about how scientific development works, it works through, through open collaboration and open data sharing. Um, and that's something that the industry doesn't, doesn't really live by today. Um, and so the solution we believe to like the high, the high cost of drug development and this, this fragmented industry that essentially lays off these costs to consumers is in one in open source R and D and second in fractionalized and decentralized ownership. Um, 
Uh, drug development isn't just like software development, though. There's a lot of similarities in the sense of that the marginal cost of producing a, a pill is close to zero. The same way that the marginal cost of producing another, um, another piece of software is also close to zero. But obviously, all of the costs are in the R&D. Um, but uh, unlike open source uh, licenses, you can't license uh, a drug. Um, you can, there are forms of licensing, but fundamentally, you need to rely on a patent. Um, but so how can we distribute the incentives around how drugs are developed? Um, and our answer to that is through fractionalized ownership. So essentially, what we're aiming to do is we're creating, um, we're creating markets for individual drugs um, by fractionalizing the ownership of the IP and the patent. Cool. How does that work? So a lot of you probably know we have been deep in the token engineering game since early 2018. Uh, and what Molecule and its architecture today really relies on are two fundamental principles. One of them is curation markets and bonding curves. And the other one is non-fungible tokens. Um, so these were both new design mechanisms that started being popularized in mid-2018, then really early 2018 and mid-2018. And now we're seeing a lot of rapid experimentation. Um, so the principle with creation markets is basically that market participants put their money where their mouth is in an open marketplace. So they stake value and attention to markets that they believe will be more valuable, very similar to, to stock markets. And the market's currency is a proxy for attention that rewards early adopters. So early adopters are proportionally rewarded. The other big mechanism are non-fungible tokens that went mainstream in also in early 2018 uh, with CryptoKitties. So CryptoKitties actually managed to break the, the Ethereum network for a while. Um, and our approach was to say early on, well, if we can attach a CryptoKitty um, to a non-fungible token, why not attach, um, attach intellectual property? It's basically proving that you have uh, ownership over a unique digital asset. Um, cool, and then we combine those two things and put them into a mechanism called the bonding curve. So a bonding curve is an economic incentive coordination tool, um, an autonomous market maker. Uh, it's a smart contract that accepts a currency in exchange for shares. Um, and this enables us to create public markets without requiring uh, an underwriter. Um, and the market's currency, as we said before, is a, is a, mark, is a proxy for, for attention. Um, now, why is this a really interesting design mechanism for, for pharma? Um, this is how the typical pharmaceutical development cycle looks like. I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with this. You have the discovery phase, preclinical, phase one, phase two, or phase three. Um, the funding requirements along these phases increase exponentially. Um, and this exponential increase looks not dissimilar to what a bonding curve kind of looks like in its exponential increase as well. Um, so that was one of the first kind of similarities that we started seeing in terms of how value discovery works. Um, now there's obviously a lot of different ways to model bonding curves and we're experimenting with different designs, specifically sigmoidal curves. Um, and, but the fundamental principle is like, what if, we, what if instead, of, uh, instead of just one single company owning this entire value chain and working on this entire value chain, what if you put this onto a distributed platform? So right now what happens, each company essentially has to go through this entire chain itself or it's individual companies and there's a lot of M&A activity that happens from one stage into the next. Um, and now essentially imagine you see all these little dots at the bottom, uh, you see some that are rejected, you see uh, things going through this pipeline. What if we distribute that pipeline and we put it into an open marketplace? Um, and this is where bonding curves are extremely helpful because they allow us to create these markets um, for drugs and therapeutics in their earliest stages of development. Cool. So what does that look like? Uh, it's essentially a two-sided uh, or a multi-sided marketplace. And we call it a Web 3.0 marketplace because it's fundamentally powered by distributed system design uh, and game theory. Um, so on the one side, you have early stage IP, which could be, we're looking at pre-patent. Um, we're looking at normal patented and then also unpatented compounds. Um, then mid-stage IP that might already be in advanced development stages or dormant IP. So someone who essentially says, I don't want to develop this anymore, but want to put it into an open marketplace. Um, so that creates now a cell side where we envision different compounds, therapeutics, drugs, um, uh, even biotech innovation to kind of come onto the marketplace and start being co-developed in an open source fashion. And on the other side, you have a buy side that is comprised of patient groups, uh, universities that might want to collaborate on developing this IP, uh, investors that are speculating on the future value. 
uh, and then pharma companies themselves. So all of these different stakeholder groups have different interests. A patient might want to uh, see a new insulin treatment being funded and developed that is in the very early stages, but could be very promising. A university might want to collaborate their lab equipment um, uh, to perform, let's say, wet lab assays on a compound that is in development in order to, a, in order to earn a certain amount of shares. Um, investors, both institutional pharma VCs as well as biotech traders, uh, might want to allocate capital in, in drugs that they deem undervalued. And pharma itself, for them, a marketplace like this is really interesting because they can essentially see it as a, as a pipeline opportunity to come in and acquire IP and kind of take it out of the marketplace again. Um, cool. I want to kind of show you guys where we are at today and kind of building out um, both the sell side and the buy side. So our development team uh, in South Africa and in Switzerland has been super, super hard at work at kind of creating a first working prototype, uh, as well as a beautiful looking user interface. Um, so with the next few slides, I just kind of want to show you where the product is at today. And over the next few weeks as well, we're going to start opening up a lot more about our product roadmap, um, the first features that we're going to be implementing, and then as well, the first use cases that we're going to be launching. Cool. So this is what um, the marketplace looks like today for a collaborator or investor. So this is essentially the buy side. So if you logged into Molecule today, you would see kind of an overview of your current um, portfolio, kind of the acquisitions that you've made, the projects that you're following and that you've invested in. Um, you kind of would see a, a feed, an activity feed, where you would see these are the drugs that have kind of gained today, the ones that have lost today. Um, whoop, just one further. Um, and then you would have a browse section where you can look at different projects that are in development. You would see who this project is being led by. Um, the different collaborators on it. You would see what stage, what funding stage is and how much of it has been funded already. Um, you could also explore different bounties that you could come and complete um, as, a, as a researcher. Uh, and then on the other side, the system is really um, also contains a lot of the patent details and the drug details um, where you can search for different scientific keywords or, or financial metrics and also verify the patent data and ensure that the patent um, is rightfully owned we're exploring um, a lot of other pathways as well, like how markets could function and what, what they would be backed by if, they're, if it's not backed by a patent. Um, yeah, so there we're kind of venturing into the whole DAO space, which is also getting really interesting. Like if, if drug development is not backed by a patent, specifically if it's done in a very open source fashion, um, then first of all, how can the drug be commercialized and how can it be taken forward? Um, and then on the last side, this is kind of the view that an IP creator has. So an IP creator would define a certain funding goal, um, what, what stage and development that they're in, um, then kind of what the different research tasks that need to be done. Uh, and then on the other side, they would define kind of the token supply curve. Um, they would define the market structure um, and the different kind of funding, the different funding milestones. Cool, so this just as a little, little preview. Um, if any of you guys are keen to get like a full view of where the demo currently stands, like we'd love to hear feedback from you. Um, so just pop us a note after the call. Um, yeah, and I think we're already in touch with quite a few of you just to get, to get more insights and, and, and feedback. Um, so we're actively taking the current prototype out now to, um, to, to different researchers, to universities uh, that we're building, um, building relationships with to kind of test their their interest. Cool. I think next up, I want to give the floor to Tyler, uh, who's going to work, walk us through one of the first use cases um, that we've been that we've been working on. Cool. Hey guys, um, just bear with me for one second. Paul, if you could stop sharing. Perfect. Okay. Um, Cool. So it's good to see lots of familiar faces here. Um, I think there's probably two or three people that I don't recognize or haven't met before. So I'll just give a quick intro to myself. My name is Tyler Galato. I'm the lead scientist for Molecule. Um, my background's in biochemistry and molecular biology. Um, after studying, I went on to do a fellowship in experimental therapeutics where I was working in sort of a translational paradigm, working on the development of drugs for pancreatic cancer, uh, glioblastoma, and neuroendocrine tumors. And later, uh, I did a fellowship in biogerontology, which is sort of the, the basic science of aging. Um, so I've sort of seen, 
I guess both sides of, of, of the research paradigm, both in a, in a basic science context and on the clinical side. Um, and what I wanted to sort of take a moment to talk about today was really the value proposition that Molecule has specifically for universities or those who are in scenarios where they're often competing for research funds um, and where research funds really dictate your ability to move a drug forward or, or carry out research in a general sense. Um, first, I'm going to just give sort of a brief overview of um, some of the key value propositions that I personally feel are important for universities from a molecule perspective. And then if you guys will indulge me, I'm going to go through quite a specific um, use case. So a use case that was um, taken from a real world scenario uh, and was sort of, yeah, been really interesting for us um, in working with some universities, sort of getting validation on some of the ideas we've had and then translating that into a sort of story actually using token bonding curves and how we can actually extract research funds um, to move a project along. Uh, one second. Cool. So this is sort of, these are the four points that I see as, as really the primary value drivers uh, for universities if they were to use Molecule. Um, accessing liquidity from underutilized or underdeveloped IP. So just, just yesterday, someone was saying, uh, an academic who directs a, a drug development program was saying that often at his university, it's the case that researchers or, or academics will, will patent simply to publish. Um, and what happens is you end up getting this, a, a lot of intellectual property or a lot of IP, this sort of dormant or not being developed actively by the university. And obviously, because there's a patent on that, um, no one else can work on these things. No one else can develop them. Uh, and really, from his perspective, there's sort of a responsibility if you're working in drug development and you do patent something to move that IP along. So one of the initial use cases we see is, is either accessing liquidity from underutilized or undeveloped intellectual property that universities might be sitting on um, or that might be completely dormant. Now with, with Molecule, there would essentially be a way to, you could either sell that intellectual property, you could find other partners to potentially co-develop it, or see, just kind of put your feelers out and see if there's an interest from investors to move these things along. Uh, another point would be to acquire funding for drugs that are already in development, but are perhaps halted. And that's sort of the use case that I'm going to be elaborating on in a moment. So this is an entirely new way to fund research and development of therapeutics that are in development when capital falls short. Now, this isn't a super common occurrence, but it does happen. And, and in the conversations that we've had with universities, we've found cases of this occurring. It occurred a few years back um, relatively famously with a cystic fibrosis drug that was really promising, um, but funding dried up, for example, and that project ultimately died. They weren't able to secure uh, investment for it uh, in bulk. Another, another, another point would be to collaborate on new projects through shared ownership models. So this idea that universities can sort of create markets for IP that they're working on and other universities that overlap in similar research areas would be able to contribute um, investment or even work in this case. Um, so one thing that we're looking at building out is this sort of bounty system where if let's say I had a university laboratory and there was a piece of preclinical development work, let's say lead optimization for a new compound that had been discovered, the, the university that creates a market for a piece of IP on molecule could actually designate and say that we'll, we will give five or 10 percent um, ownership, X number of shares in this piece of intellectual property in exchange for another university carrying out work, um, which is a nice way that this could potentially operate to accelerate drug development without even having um, money exchanged, for example. And, and the last point is really just to promote open science and innovation. As, as Paul mentioned, um, the pharmaceutical industry is sort of archetypally closed um, and, and universities are sort of I think beginning to recognize this um, as, as well, this problem in the sciences more generally. Um, science is innately supposed to be open. Uh, the term open science is almost ridiculous. It shouldn't even have to be spoken. Um, but I think as, yeah, as money gets into these sort of things and, and, and greed, it, it's, yeah, it's, it's, there's a lot of, um, I guess, protecting and ensuring profits as opposed to working in an open way and knowledge sharing. Um, cool, one second. Okay, uh, sorry, my computer is jumped ahead there a bit. Cool, so, so the next um, 
the next part of this is just, I'm going to run you quickly through a real world scenario um, that we encountered with a university uh, actually based in, in South Africa. So essentially there was, there was a, a multi-university collaborative project to develop um, this really big push that was supported by this, this venture fund for malaria. Um, where a university here was basically uh, awarded a fairly large grant uh, and a compound library to support the development of this of this novel um, anti malaria uh, anti malarial drug so um, which is a huge problem just as an aside and, and not a lot of people know this, but you could you could fact check me on it, but half of all people who have ever died um, have died from malaria. Um, it's a shocking thing. There's a great radio lab episode about this if anyone cares to go listen to it, but, but it's an extremely common disease. That said, it's, it's incredibly neglected because it primarily affects the third world uh, and areas that, that don't really have access to medicines. Uh, so, so there's constantly these quests to identify anti-malarias that, that could be produced very, in a very cost-effective way and delivered out to areas that, where there's a need. But anyway, this university um, had a lot of success. They basically identified a, a compound with potent anti-malarial activity. They were supported by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, which supports basically up to phase one or phase two of, of clinical trials. Um, at, and at that point, the money ran out. This project is still halted. Um, and we're basically trying to work on the creation of a use case with them. And one of the things that we want to illustrate was specifically how funding could be extracted from a token bonding curve or from a market um, and how these things could sort of work in practice, which is something that we haven't really revealed previously or in, in, in our outward facing collateral. But anyway, the university decides um, that they're going to create a, a market on molecule and it's expected that they're going to need $2 million to carry the drug through the subsequent clinical trial all stages required for market approval. The university also wants to retain 50% of the intellectual property rights. The numbers that I use here could be interchanged, um, and this is sort of, but this is sort of the real use case. So they want to maintain 50% of the intellectual property rights, and the other 50% is going to be made available for any investor, institutional, other universities, traders uh, in this market on molecule. So the first thing we would do is set a, a share supply. Um, in this case, we're just arbitrarily sort of deciding it will be 100,000 shares, which uh, sort of determines the level of divisibility, how many investors could theoretically get into this market. And there's also a development tax that's placed. Uh, in this case, it's gonna be 20%. And the 80%, the remaining 80% is essentially um, provided to create a liquid market for, for, for um, buyers and sellers to trade in and out of seamlessly. So, and just to sort of drive this home, token bonding curves in this case are acting as automated market makers. Um, so you don't need someone to underwrite buys and sells. Essentially, I can give money to, to, this, to the smart contract and it will give me shares, or I can give shares to the smart contract um, and it will give me capital. Um, so therefore there is some proportion of the money that's invested into these markets that is required to create that liquid market. And 20% of the investment is gonna go directly to the university to fund the drugs development. So because this is a clinical trial that needs to be bootstrapped, there's, there's basically two prongs to this, to this scenario. Um, the first injection of capital needs to happen in bulk to support, let's say, the launch of the clinical trial effort. And after that, there will be another scenario in which continuous fundraising can occur every time a new investment is made. But since the initial capital injection needs to happen in bulk to support the clinical trial efforts, the university starts off with a Dutch auction for price discovery, which could take place on the network. 10% uh, um, of the total supply, so 10,000 shares are offered to the public in initial sale and bids from five different institutional investors are received. And this also allows you to basically establish a share price, which in this case was $150 per share. And ultimately, at the culmination of that duct auction, $1.5 million has been raised, of which 20%, $300,000, can be accessed immediately by the university for research spending. Um, the other 80% remains locked as curve collateral. And just to just sort of elaborate a little bit, you can parameterize these markets in any way. You can basically parameterize it to guarantee success or meet a funding goal, or, and also further to invalidate that offering. So if you don't receive the 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 amount of funds that are needed, the money could simply be returned to investors and, and the whole thing sort of yeah, called off. Now, at this point, the remaining 40 per shares, so, so just to, I know the numbers get a bit confusing, but the university has 50% of the intellectual property, 10% was offered in a Dutch auction, which allowed uh, an initial 
bulk capital like uh, injection, $300,000 of that can be spent. But now there's another 40% that over time will be continuously distributed to anyone who buys into these markets. And basically what you see here is a token bonding curve where the top curve is the buy price and the bottom curve is the sell price. So anytime an investment takes place, 20% will go directly to the university, the other 80% remains in the curve as capital. So once that funding goal of 2 million has been reached, the bonding curve, for example, would be locked up, no additional shares can be minted. Um, at that stage, ownership percentage and shareholder rights are frozen. And if the collected funds are not sufficient to actually finish the clinical process and reach regulatory approval, the creator, for example, could put more of his own stake up for sale to initialize a new market offering, remembering that the university still has 50% of that IP ownership. And this essentially makes this a bit of a modular building block, block for, for, for new drug candidates that are stuck in, for example, early developmental stages or even late developmental stages. Um, and if regulatory approval was successful and the drug is ultimately brought to market, governance around the drug's commercialization, production, distribution, royalty rights, for example, would be coordinated among shareholders in that market, ultimately led by, by the creator, which in this case is the university. Um, this is one area where we still, yeah, we're still, I think a lot of research to do, um, a lot of validation, a lot of feedback. Um, increasingly, we've sort of been developing molecule and getting an idea of what it might look like, for example, to, to let's say bring an early stage, a mid stage, a late stage piece of IP through, through this pipeline. But invariably, invariably, because we are introducing additional complexity into this, now you have, let's say, a number of different shareholders uh, it, it, that are basically governing a piece of IP and how it's commercialized, there still would need to be conversations, for example, is it, is it everyone with greater than a 10% share that has, let's say, a vote in commercialization? But again, these things could at this point be left up to, to the market creator, for example. Um, yeah, still lots to do there. Um, yeah, but I hope that you guys found that valuable. I know it's a, we went, th I think, from a very high level sort of introductory um, look into molecule and do a very specific use case. I think there's still a lot of gaps to fill in the middle. Um, yeah, but I'd be happy to take any questions and hopefully that, that made um, sort of the funding scenario a bit more clear for a few people. Thanks so much. Amazing, thank you so much, Tyler, for your presentation. Um, if anyone has any questions, I see Veronica has one now. Um, Tyler, do you wanna just read it out and then maybe answer the question? Yeah, sure. Okay, so, so Veronica says, have you considered approaching governments? It could be a very interesting way for governments, governments to be able to invest in more high-risk drugs than other in, uh, investors would not invest in, and, and that the governments could gain partial ownership of these drugs and be able to get ROI on taxes spent. So, so that's a really good, really interesting question. In, in the United States, for example, the National Institutes of Health is the government body that's basically tasked with, with they maintain their own intramural research laboratories, but they also fund all biomedical research. For example, this is how like medical schools are ranked based on the amount of NIH funding that they receive for their projects. Um, I think it's, so the, the process by which the US government generates money to like via tax, for example, to support biomedical research, um, I guess in that sense, yeah, it's an interesting question. Like, like, I think it would definitely make sense to potentially engage governments, although I think that there are elements of this that, that would be hard for them to swallow. Um, that said, I think maybe a, a step before that that would be particularly viable would be like approaching, let's say, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation or the Wellcome Trust or grant funding agencies that are fully philanthropic um, and don't necessarily have sustainable models on how, how they're generating new capital. So if, I think it might be interesting, but at the same time, governments could be interested in, in, in this as well. Um, I think we'll probably need a lot of proof of principle and proof of concept, but it would be very cool to approach, yeah, like, like um, a, a government organization like the NIH to see if they have an appetite for this sort of thing. Um, I think in the future, we'll definitely do that. Um, there's a question from Charlie as well. Can you run over again the token minting model? Right now I have heard two, the static amount determined at the market creation and tokens minted against new liquidity injected into the market. Not sure about the second one. Okay, let me see. I'm just trying to make sure I understand that question correctly. The static amount determined at market creation. Yeah. yeah, so so that's that's not necessarily the minting of new tokens. So so it would be it would be that 
in the use case that I that I said, it, it, a, a share price of let's say 100,000 shares is determined. I suppose we could just think about that as as the token amount. Initially, 10% of those tokens is offered up as a Dutch auction to allow for an like an, a, an injection of capital that's very specific to this use case where the, there's a need for that, and then the remaining token supply. So the university has 50,000 tokens. Then 10,000 are offered as, as, a, added, as a, Dutch, a Dutch auction, and 40% of those remaining tokens are distributed along a token bonding curve. Um, so we're, it's not necessarily that you're, does, does that sort of make sense? I'm not sure if I, if I made that clear. Um, um, if you guys want, we can also move into more of an open discussion type um, situation. So you're welcome to unmute yourselves and actually engage directly you now. I think that'll make it flow a little bit easier. Okay, yeah, that might be easier. Yeah, I, I absolutely, yeah, I think I'm just a bit confused because um, I, yeah, I guess maybe it's the, the different numbers are throwing me off. But then I guess from yeah. your second explanation, what you mean is that the um, the tokens, like the second tokens being minted against new liquid, that's not actually happening. So it's token uh, value that already exists at market creation, but it's just released into the market whenever there are people it, buy it. Exactly. So, so at the point of market creation, a, a supply would be determined, and I think there still needs to be there still needs to be a lot of work done to determine what, let's say, a, a token supply that makes sense would be. Right. If you're getting a small number of institutional investors in, it might not make sense to have hundreds of thousands of tokens, for example. And we did choose those numbers somewhat arbitrarily, but just the idea with with that was that an initial an initial ten percent of that token supply was basically reserved to be sold in mass at once to institutional investors to allow for like a bulk capital investment. Uh, and then 40% were basically issued continuously. Um, so every time somebody makes an investment, 20% um, of that would just go directly to the university, but this would happen over a period of time. Um, but yeah, the tokens are sort of, I guess in this case, the, the tokens are sort of minted at the point of market creation uh, and just held until there's, there's buyers or sellers. Okay, cool. So I mean, was your question also around like if the if the token supply was continuous or like fixed? Yeah, I mean, but I guess it is fixed, right? That's it, 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 yeah, it is fixed. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the holders of the there are scenarios where you could say the holders of the tokens are, like decide to do like a secondary issuance, essentially a dilution, as you would as you would have with existing, like, in existing shares in in equity. Yeah, um, I mean, I guess like. Um, that would be would that be a layer that you guys are covering though in molecule Maybe. it's a it's a layer that we're thinking about but like i think in some cases the easiest way might be that essentially the bonding curve serves as a as an initial bootstrapping mechanism and that then essentially those tokens that are have been created start trading on secondary on secondary markets um if you then need further financing rounds as you would have that in like like a share dilution like like you have in the real world um, that would then need to be handled through through governance, like governance decisions made by by the existing um, token holders. And I mean, this is maybe more of an implementation thing. But how are you guys thinking about off ramping for funding going into the market? Like, if you have funding going into the market, um, and then you have it obviously reflected in the form of of crypto but off-ramping that funding from, from the university perspective is probably like a bit tricky, right? I, I think, good question. We have been thinking about off-ramping. Um, we hope that initially we won't be handling volume where off-ramping would be a problem. I think off-ramping is a general problem though that you have with any kind of crypto implementation if you work with open networks, so if you use and there, my hope is kind of like if, if a university can create a Coinbase account, um, then they can off ramp via DAI. That might still feel like a little bit janky and not institutional in the beginning, but I think that's a general problem that the crypto space has in terms of how do we translate native crypto like money into like real world money on a, on a bank account. It right, might... but then are you pegging your token to DAI? So our token, there's no token in our case being used in this, in this example. So the, 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 essentially what it looks like from the front end is you're just interacting with US dollars, but it might be represented in DAI in the back end. Okay, okay. 
Yeah. So all of the bonding curve work that we're doing is like using using guy at this at this stage. Okay. So you basically take like the integer valuation of the patent asset, and then you kind of basically translate that into die. Or is there some sort of intermediary where, because as far as I know, DAI doesn't support NFT asset or, you know, an NFT asset at this, at this point. Um, it does in the sense of that you're just, you're staking the NFT into the bonding curve. So the bonding curve contract is the, just gets technical, but this is the owner address of the NFT. Uh, and then it's just a normal bonding curve contract that, yeah. There's no, like, there's no NFT value that you're pegging it to. Does that make sense? Okay. But then, okay. then like, what, what does the price feed into DAI? Into the CDP, I guess, in this case. Or whatever it is that you're doing to get DAI. No, no, I mean, you're not getting, so you would just assume that people are using DAI or any stable coin to invest. The same way that you would use US dollars to invest in anything. Okay. 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 Yeah. I mean, if someone someone could buy that die on the open market, or uh, yeah, we're also looking at using other stable coins. Um, it's it's kind of what we built the prototype with, and what we see working right now. But but as you said, there are I think with any crypto project that's leveraging this tech, there's always considerations around off ramping into real world, into real world assets. Um, I, I personally, I feel the advantages of having something in an open network like this, specifically in the context of DeFi, are bigger than saying, let's build it in a centralized way. Um, okay. Yeah. Okay. okay. Um, hi, sorry, I joined a bit late, but I might have missed this, but I was joining once, once the IP is, once the IP is gone through and the patent is gained, and everyone's bought their shares and the shares are frozen, how does distribution of, for example, funds coming in from the selling, the licensing of the patent or those type of things, how does that happen? How does that evolve? How is this involved in that, that aspect of the whole patenting process? Yeah, cool question. So this is one thing to consider is like these development cycles are very long. Um, so that happens like it's, let's say at some point a marketed molecule is bought up by a pharma company or let's say the the drug actually goes to market so what happens from a legal perspective is that that asset so the patent is placed into a into a legal entity uh which could be um a delaware series llc uh it could be another special purpose vehicle depending on where the original patent is sitting uh, and then essentially what you do is you sell tokens of ownership in that entity. And so now if there was either a, um, if there was a licensing event where you could say, cool, we're actually now commercializing this, this drug, then revenues would flow into that entity and would then flow from that entity to token holders. That's one, one way. Another way is if there's a takeover event, let's say where uh, a larger pharma company comes along and says, cool, we would like to buy this drug out and take this to the through the next stages of development. Um, then that buyout, essentially, they would make a buyout offer to all the existing token holders in the market and say, we are taking this market private, um, which also mirrors some of the elements that you see um, when a public company is essentially taken, taken private again. Did, did that answer your question? Um, yeah, I know that did. That, that was cool. I understand that. Um, then just one other thing is that this would start pre. This would start pre patent. So, how do you handle public disclosure? I mean, we're not necessarily working with people we know. It could be some random account. How do you handle public disclosure and prevent the ruining of a patent? So, so it's not necessarily happening pre patent. Uh, in many cases, so one of the core assumptions with this, and like in the in the example that I just gave with the university, there is a patent. Um, so what we're looking at exploring is the introduction of unpatented or pre-patent IP, but, but as you mentioned, it introduces this layer of complexity. So, <clears throat> so with something that was unpatented, but where there was a plan to patent in the future, you might have something 
for example, like an automatic filing of an NDA that occurs. If you want to invest into that market, you, you are legally bound to not disclose any information until the, until the point of, of patenting. Um, but again, I think part of the reason that we're initially building this out on patents and fractionalizing ownership in them uh, is because it's a little bit more clear legally, albeit still quite gray, but uh, legally than if you were if you were creating a market for an unpatented piece of intellectual property. Um, because even if you do sign an NDA, if that information does get out and there's evidence of prior art, um, yeah, the burden is sort of on the, the, the person who owns the intellectual property to, to fight that legally, which creates a yeah, massive headache. So we, we need to be quite careful um, moving forward with, with how we create markets and how we create exchanges for intellectual property that is not actually protected under anything else but trade secrets, for example. But, but we're working on it. Um, it's, a, it's an immensely complex issue. But I mean, a patent application, you can easily file a patent application on everything, right? It will give you a right for like three months to fight for yeah, patent. So, like, right. Exactly. So, so I mean, in, in, in the United States, you can have like a patent pending for, for yeah, years. Yeah and yeah, still be exactly. yeah, yeah. protected. Um, so as long as a patent has been, has been filed, you would be fine. Um, but particularly like, we hope that at some point the, the, the platform could handle like, let's say you discovered, let's say there's a company working at the very earliest stages of drug discovery. So <clears throat> maybe I'm doing like even computer assisted um, drug discovery at, at the very early stages where it's not necessarily clear if the IP is even promising. And maybe you bundle together, let's say a thousand different compounds that they've discovered, one of which may ev eventually make it to market or so promise. And people still want to be able to invest in that as a pathway. It would be great if we could identify ways to protect the, the original IP creator in those situations legally. But yeah, again, this is, yeah, this is a, it, it's going yeah. to be complex. But like you said, as long as there's some, as long as a patent has been filed, um, then yes, the person is protected. Okay, cool, thanks. That, that, that's, you, you cleared that up for me. And, and the final idea is to get like rid of the like patented IP, right? It's a long yeah, the, term, the yeah. final idea is... <laughs> yeah, I know, I know, yeah. <laughs> to get rid of it. So, I mean, yeah. um, IP is kind of like, oh, patents are a necessary evil. Yeah. We, we think, so patents are essentially monopolies, and that's kind of where the whole problem in the industry comes from, uh, the, how that creates monopolistic and rent-seeking behavior. Because essentially what the patent allows you to do, once you hit that blockbuster breakthrough drug, you can price it at whatever you want. So there's, there's um, a company, a Swiss large Swiss pharma company, for example, brought a new gene therapy to the market that is currently being priced at $2.1 million per treatment, which is <laughs> very high. But there are economic, for, from their side, there's economic justifications for why it's okay to sell a drug treatment for $2.1 million. Essentially, what the patent allows you to do to recoup all of the investment costs. And so we think the first step of getting away from that monopolization is distributing the ownership in the long run. So that already kind of breaks up the patent because suddenly you can start thinking, well, why do we still need the patent if we've already created this distributed market for it that can start funding the development? Um, I think in the long run, these things will much more become a data play. Um, and that we will see like governance structures emerge around these markets. Uh, and then I think it gets into a much more like sci-fi like discussions around decentralized autonomous organizations um, that essentially co-develop, uh, jointly develop a drug um, and that essentially center their value creation around, around data, uh, around the value that can be extracted from that data. Um, yeah. If you see it on a larger picture, like let's say 250 years, like when patents were first like invented, there was kind of like the idea of patent is to lay open. It was not to protect something. So the root stem of patents means like to open, just like publication in, in science, right? And as you said, like science should be open by default. So, but this was like this, like 200, year, uh, 200 years ago, technology it was just okay to give these grants or this right to like three or four people who actually filed it. But, and then it like came the time when the patent system was like abused, yeah, or what like, and now with blockchain technology and all this distributed and DAOs, we have basically the situation to recreate something so that it can like the, the fundamental aim of patents to like have something open and have people openly participating everybody 
to recreate it, right? So this is like, so it's actually going, bringing back the initial ideas of patents. Just like 200 years ago, it was not, it was not possible to like account who contributed what and easily, right? And yeah, I, I, I definitely think like, what you're saying in 20 or 30 years time, like, I think the hope is that, that pharmaceuticals, healthcare, like these things are developed open source, source, it's treated like a public utility, um, and done in the interest, you know, less so in the interest of profit and maybe new business models, you know, emerge around the same way it did with open source software. The business models no longer, the, the fact that you're buying this piece of software, it's with maybe the services that are provided tangentially or something like that. But if you look at, like the open source pharma movement, for example, the thing that they've really struggled with fundamentally, they have researchers committing data to a GitHub. They have people working on these projects. The problem is, is ultimately comes down to commercialization and how you actually, how you actually commercialize these things. So my hope is that Molecule sort of represents this intermediary step between the current system, the way it is, and this fully open source sort of future. And that fractionalized ownership in patents is almost like a hand holding like let's jump into the future like it's you're still sort of held to the past um and it's safe and it's recognizable and i know what a patent is okay we're fractionalizing ownership in it but but this is still a step forward and then like paul said yeah 10 years from now 20 years from now why do we even still have patents all of these different people on these patents everything should just be open source um yeah, yeah. that's sort of what happens but it's yeah it's a it's a it's an industry that's it's like trying to facilitate like trying to steer a cruise ship quickly you know what I mean? Yeah. It's not, it's resistant to change, uh, but we'll get there. Well, what's your opinion on patents, Anka? Like, oh, oh, my, my, my opinion on patents? Yeah. Uh, yeah, less, what I said, like, I really think like, it was just like the technology when patents were first invented, it was to give the people the incentive, like to, to actually publish, there was a baker in like London and to like give his receipt for like bread, he was allowed to like bake it with his receipt for 20 years. There's like these stories. And this basically, so it was an incentive for people to work in an open way with like 250 years ago technology and to like say who can like benefit from this, uh, from this like laying open of the, techno of the technology or the invention, right? And there, was, there were no other ways. It was really hard to track like who contributed. So it was just like the name of the people that were on the papers that were actually filed. And then the patent system became like a self-sustaining thing, like you all know, with all the overhead and lawyers and like we still have all these media breaches when you do all this stuff. And, and now um, we have a new way of like, open it up and like track the contribution to people like little investments like what you guys doing in a new way in a very open manner that was it's always look it's always good to look at like how would you do something if there would be no legacy system today right so we would say like okay here yeah why not create a token bonding curve like have people contributing investing and then uh tracing tracking like there's like this idea to like actually track people's contribution to invention, to research via blockchain system in a decentralized way without a third party that can manipulate. And then basically have people, when the drug is being sold, like get some, uh, get some of the revenue stream back to the people who actually contributed to that, right? So this is like even one step further. So you are like basically when they go to the pharmacy, so these are like these ideas, right? Out. So, and I think this is a great way of like uh, bringing the, Bring the patent system or the overall idea of like having an abstract legal thing of protectable IP uh, to bring it back to the original idea to incentivize the people that contributed to it in a way so that they are mostly open and not restraining. Right? And I hope, yeah, so I mean, basically you are saying it all the time. <laughs> you are, I mean, I'm following you uh, since like one and a half years now, and this is like a great thing. And uh, I think you are aware of all these discussions and bringing the crypto economy and the blockchain things together in a legal way, in a, in, a, in, a, in a way that can be actually touched and understood by people because it's a lot about storytelling and communicating. And I think we had the discussion once that there's like people have, like some people don't even understand how markets work, right? And uh, they, first, like, they first have the discussion now when they are like, confronted with token bonding curves of his crypto economy. Yeah. So yeah, it's cool. Yeah. 
Yeah, it's an interesting, like, I mean, it's sort of a blessing and a curse in a lot of ways, I think, with, yeah. with these projects is that you like, I mean, in a perfect world, you would be able to go to someone and like, so like internally, there's always this trying to come up with like, the one sentence elevator pitch for Molecule. But the, unfortunately, there's so much you need, like, you need an understanding of markets, you need an understanding of crypto, you need an understanding of things like token bonding curves, you need an understanding of pharma, you need, like, it's, it's yeah. a lot, I think, for people to wrap their head around. Um, and it can be a barrier as well, like the blockchain aspect, although it makes a lot of sense in terms of like distributed finance, for example, or fractionalizing intellectual property, you, you are battling this reality that like most people don't have a solid understanding of, of blockchain, particularly, I mean, obviously outside of the blockchain community. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I mean, we always open to like <laughs> suggestions, ideas, like how, how do you learn to simplify these things and communicate them effectively with people without sort of scaring them or... Exactly, yeah, yeah. <laughs> this is a very, very tough thing. That's a yeah. very tough thing, I noticed that too. Tyler, yeah. I've just, just on that, I've slowly come yeah. to, the, to the point that it's just like Molecule is a, a marketplace for drug development. Yeah, uh, I think like, exactly. I think that's. I, I think it's a super far stretch as well. But it's like imagine if you imagine if Uber is like, Uber is the first taxi company without any cars, and Airbnb is the first, the first hotel chain without any. Real yeah. This is kind yeah. of like a marketplace, like, like a pharma marketplace without any labs or, or IP yeah. itself, but that just facilitates the entire value engine around it and innovation engine around it. Um, yeah. And, and I, my hope is as well, like, it's great that you hear Zanke that we'll see more and more similar developments in other areas of science. Yeah. I still feel like science is a field that is so, that hasn't really been touched yet by a lot of technological innovation. It's been touched from a, like, from a, I can now do my research more effectively by having this better tool, but not on a holistic, like, organizational level. Um, Okay. Yeah. 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 It's 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 but it's really difficult. So we had like even <laughs> even, yeah. even, even <laughs> yeah even to tell scientists like what a DAO could do to just to manage a research project if there's money. You know, don't 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 talk about token bonding curves or like continuous organizations or whatever. Just to distribute money and have people voting on, I want to spend on this. Exactly. Yeah. At, at the yeah. end of the day, I think what the research wants to hear is, okay, do I have like money for my research funding? Like, yes yeah. or no. If you can find a way to like, yeah, just like a this to the point of like, this is a new way to get to get funding to for to, research. People to, are to, open to that. So what we are selling at the moment is like having doubts. So there's grant money, like fifty thousand for a precise project, and you want to distribute it among your lab people or in a collaborative way and use a DAO for that. You know, and the argument is we don't have this decentralized wow blockchain thing that is an autonomous organization. So what a DAO gives, uh, like a voting governance structure and an accounting all at the same time blockchain proof, right? So if, today it's like you have research money, you have a sort of a governance, you have, and then you have the accounting and all is separated by hundreds of media breaches and all these things, right? So to just like bring the advantage of this into like, uh, so that scientists understand the potential, uh, yeah, it's a, it's a thing, right? It's a thing to make them understand. And then they like divert in like areas and it's, they, it's hard to like keep them focused on what it could actually do, right? Yeah. Yeah. Cool, guys. I'm also just looking at the time. I think maybe some interesting topics that we could touch in next month's call, because uh, there are also things that keep coming up and that people are interested in is the legal side. Uh, yeah, yeah, so just... maybe we, we could run, we could do a run through through our current legal model and how we think about these things. Also, yeah, uh, I see <laughs> Charlene is very excited about that. Yeah, I was about to ask, but it's yeah. good when you do And I think that. also, yeah. I think what's interesting yeah. beside our legal model is the general implications of using bonding curves and what that, what bonding curves have, these market makers, the legal implications of those. Because specifically, if you get into securities territory, there's very interesting implications of if you suddenly have a liquid tradable asset, because a lot of those securities offerings actually have like lock-ins and there's a whole rabbit hole to get into there. And then I think the other topic to maybe get into a little bit would be what we've been thinking about governance um, around these markets once you create them. Um, yeah, if you guys have any topics that you would like us to specifically address, um, please feel free to drop them in the chat or... or... Um, yeah, if you could actually drop those in the 
yeah. we, on the Telegram. We have like a treasure chest of different topics that we've been diving deep into within the team and that we slowly want to start opening up to the community as well to get more thoughts around and, and engagement. I just, okay, so, so what about like if we like in like some two weeks or in a few weeks or months, just like with a group of people play everything through with a molecule platform or just be like, like we have a pattern, we are like investing, we have some results or are you planning on doing something like this in a more that open would be way? a fun exercise. Yeah. Like even if we yeah. just if, if everyone assumes a role, like yeah, like, uh, and we and we actually and then people just sort of raise questions or like create issues or something, and we have to work through that. That would be a, an amazing exercise, I think. Okay, uh, cool. So yeah, I would love to participate in that. Yeah, and yeah, yeah. that's that's so, a great suggestion, Zanka. Okay, cool. Yeah. So just like one day or a few hours, and we just like oh, I have this patent, I have this research results, and and we have some investors and yeah good yeah that would be awesome cool cool okay Devin, do you want to wrap it up uh yeah so thank you so much everyone for coming to join us we've actually just hit the one hour mark as well which is perfect timing for our wrap up um really looking forward to seeing you guys as well again next month so a lot of you have signed up already through the google form and i'll send you an invite now for a recurring monthly invite um, and you can just dial in via that um, if you do have any questions after the school as well please feel free to reach out to us on the molecule telegram channel i dropped the link into um into this chat and if you didn't manage to catch it then you're also welcome to drop me an email um, and yeah then we'll see you guys again next month thanks so much it was really awesome to hear it was really interesting. Thanks, guys. Have a great one. Thanks. Thanks, Thanks everyone. everyone. Bye. Bye-bye.